Welcome everyone to March's session of Neglected Books Reading Group with our publisher Spotlight. This month we're talking with Eland about, uh, which is a wonderful press focusing on travel writing, which has brought back just a, a, a remarkable catalog of material. And uh, we have with us Barnaby Rogerson, the publisher, who, uh, when I approached him, uh, selected John uh, Freely's uh, book, Stamble Sketches. And uh, I hope everybody, if you've had a chance to read it, uh, uh, enjoyed it. It's, uh, I just, in fact, was telling Barnaby, I got an email from someone who won't be able to participate, but he said he's so happy that he read the book because he felt like he was being led through the streets of Istanbul with John Freely pulling him by the elbow and pointing things out. And I think many of us wish we had had opportunities to go through cities with somebody who understands so much about uh, about the background and the history uh, of, of the book. I'm gonna start with a couple of uh, slides just to get things going here, um, if you don't mind. Sorry. So as I said, this month we're focusing on Eland and uh, Stemble sketches. Um, Eland focuses on travel writing, and uh, but I think to some ways I have to say it's it's sort of that's the one of one of the one, terrible things about publishing, and particularly, and I know Barnaby knows this, when you have to enter data, metadata for books, you're at, you have to label these books. And because the truth is many of the books that, that he publishes, it's, it's really doing them a disservice to call them travel books because they're just wonderful books. So they're memorial, some of them are, are memoristic. Some of them are historical in focus. Some of them are almost, I think, like uh, Gerald Handley's book. I forget the name of the title for the moment, but his the memoir Warriors. about yeah. the Warriors. What yeah. a fabulous book. I mean, that is just like immersing in in a culture and in a time. And it, it's novelistic and it's just a wonderful, rich book uh, about Somalia, I guess, in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, so Barnaby has joined us here uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, Istanbul Sketches by John Freely. Freely, uh, I remember this book but i honestly had not read it before barnaby suggested it i had no idea that freely was such a prolific and kind of a polymathic author because his expertise he was a scientist and a historian of this of science then he moved his family to istanbul uh, as is mentioned uh, in his daughter's note at the end of the book uh, he moved his family uh, uh, to Istanbul, uh, became associated with the college there, and ended up living there for for decades and immersing himself uh, in in Ottoman culture, Turk culture, uh, classical culture in that area. Writing dozens of books, including a series of novels uh, uh, set in the Ottoman times. Uh, so. Uh, this is this is just the tip. This book is really the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of the oeuvre of uh, John Freely. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop out and um, just invite Bonner to be, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we're going to take a few minutes just to tell us about uh, the press and uh, kind of where it came from and 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 where you see it going. Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, Elan's been going for about 40 years. It created, um, it started very much in the spirit of neglected books, because there was um, a journalist called John Hatt, who was um, traveling in Southeast Asia, and stumbled across this um, amazing a book called The Dragon Apparent. And he oh, was Norman Lewis's. Oh, Norman this Lewis's. is, what a fabulous book. And he was working as a publisher's rep, going around bookshops uh, before books are published and getting advance orders, dues, very much on the sort of coal face of publishing. And he couldn't find any of the existing publishers to revive a book that was already in print. So um, A Dragon Apparent had become a neglected book. 
And he um, ended up just sitting up Eland out of frustration that this really brilliant book that explains really the troubles that are going to befall any person who involves themselves in the Vietnamese Civil War, um, France, as we know, and, and America suffered you know, so, so much from that. Right. And as you said, travel books is too weak a term for it. It's just the most extraordinary briefing about everything to do with Southeast Asia and the divisions between sort of ancient Buddhist and Catholic families and all the fisher lines. Mm -hmm. And that is what's extraordinary about these books is that they are better than a whole course of history and anthropology is they've got some writer really letting you down. And what we love is doing it with humor, with, with literary style, you know, with right. sort of passion that you might just flounder in your third year of your university course and not I guess. just want to put in a plug for other readers uh, today that uh, A Dragon Apparent by Norman Lewis, uh, which is still available from Elon. It's a wonder. It's set actually right, I guess you would say around 55. So it's it's actually, if you've ever read Graham Greene's novel, The Quiet American, it's a great mm -hmm. book to read yeah. kind of in companion with The Quiet American, because that's the time at which uh, Lewis is writing where the French are still the occupying power. Uh, but, you know, the, the Fisher lines are starting to show. There's a wonderful episode uh, where Lewis, I think, spends the night with a, an outpost along the, the highway that the French are trying to protect. Uh, and you really get the sense that, you know, that their their sense of control essentially diminishes down to a few meters uh, diameter once the dark falls and they realize that they're in the midst of uh, a country that they may consider themselves an occupier but they're really they're almost besieged wherever they are uh, and that's a, just a powerful evocation and that's just one great scene in that book I'm so glad, Brad, that you know and love it as well. So that was the incubation of Elan, 1982. John really annoyed that the rest of the world wasn't paying attention to this incredibly fluent book. And then Normalus had got some other amazing books, including Naples 44, which is ex his experience as a sergeant in the British Intelligence Corps in occupied Naples that had just endured a whole lot of British and American bombing and then was liberated and then gets bombed by the Germans terrible time but it's really a testimony to how civilization and decency can survive in the most you know testing of circumstances Absolutely. so that was the sort of that was the heart of of eland is norman lewis who is not the normal when i say normal there is a sort of tradition in britain of, of well-educated boys out of oxford and cambridge eaton a sort of easygoing elite proving themselves by traveling and coming back and publishing books and then perhaps um, slipping in somewhere towards the um, the sort of heartland of the administration in, in Britain. Right. And right. Norman was completely different. He was from the poor suburbs, Welsh. His father was a chemist with a sort of embarrassing enthusiasm for spiritualism. He was completely a sort of self-made um, character who raced cars, you know, developed cameras um, in British society, really rather wonderfully sort of unliterary mainstream. And he has this marvelous querulous tradition. Mm -hmm. And I've had good fortune of traveling with um, Don McCullum, who's one of the great war photographers of all times. And he was often paired up as a young man with Norman Lewis and reveres him as a sort of avuncular figure who taught him on the road of the reality of the world. Um, and then John had had tremendous fun developing Eland over 20 years. And then he flew out to California. He was a very traditional uh, character, but he flew next door to a long haired nerd from Silicon, what was going to be Silicon Valley, who told him about the web revolution. And on the way back from London, he set up cheapflights.com and developed it very successfully and sold it for millions of, millions of pounds and nearly killed himself with overwork. Mm -hmm. So 20 years in, he was looking around for someone to take over. And then fortunately, I'd written to him a couple of passionate handwritten letters in green and purple ink. 
as a student from Scotland, because I really revered what he was doing, and particularly the books he was reprinting about North Africa, which I was already interested in as a young man. And he said, come and have tea with me under the strict understanding that I'm never going to employ a young man who writes to me in purple ink. And but <laughs> we, we started talking and getting on quite well. And then later on, I wrote guidebooks to these places I was very interested in, Morocco, Tunisia, Cyprus, and Istanbul. And each time I do quite a lot of background reading and write to him saying, you must reprint this and you must reprint that. He never took any of my advice. And so later on, I decided to do what he'd done, revive neglected books. And we can talk about my initial list, but mm -hmm. very much fueled by my excitement of Istanbul, which we're going to bring us up to John Freely soon. And I wrote him this letter, which I didn't need to do, but I just thought it was polite because I'm copying what you did. And it was just one of those miraculous sort of good timings when he said, you, you know, your letter arrived just on the right day. Of, I want to sell the business. Someone wants to take it on. And I'm going to make you my successor for what turned out to be a very, very reasonable price. Because including included in that, his last list of books was something that two years later sold 700,000 copies. So whatever money I had paid for it was more than paid back. <laughs> in which title that was one, that? It was called The Road to Nab End. Oh, okay. And, and it's... um. It's something I'm afraid I would never have spotted. I'm not a, a brilliant commercial publisher. I'm much, much more excited about things that uh, need to be revived. But it, it did incredibly well. And it um, certainly held our hands for the first of seven years as we started to add books. Um, we, Like John, we're not aggressive. We sort of tend to add four, six, sometimes eight, almost all reprinted titles. Mm -hmm. And then we picked up, again by chance, Dervla Murphy, who was one of the great passionate, independent voices of British travel writing. I say British in a very large field because she's right. from a, a really strong Irish identity. Both her father and grandfather were Republicans that she fought the British. But she's um, in, the, in that broad category of, 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 sort of English writers. And she hated the idea that this old family business she used to publish for, John Murray, who she adored, knew the family in Credit World, slept on their sofa whenever she was in London had been sold to a big corporation and she was looking for somebody that she could feel that was on the same ethical compass as her. And she came to us and that was a useful moment, having a very, very valid voice, very off-center, very liberal, um, very internationalist, but also passionately self-determining. We'd never and taken a vote. Fearless, fearless, my God. Absolutely fearless. I've just, um, she sadly died um, last year, well, not sadly, she'd, she'd lived the full length of her life, age 90. Um, my wife, who's not in the screen um, at the moment, um, had intuition this time last year, just before Easter, that we should go out to Lismore and have a couple of days drinking and talking to Devla. And we realised that that was you know, wow. very good time because she was on the way out. She was incredibly strong character, never took a publisher's advance, never had a literary agent, never took anybody's advice, just went out there. And sometimes it didn't turn into a book, but just did all the the traveling on her bicycle. On Absolutely. Her own. Yeah. Very limited budget. Um, if if uh, folks yeah. aren't familiar, I think her first book was Full Tilt. Was that the? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Full Tilt, where a single woman rides, let's see, basically from Istanbul-ish across to India, right? That's that that you bicycle from her home in Lismore. Oh, that's right, that's right. Oh my god, it's the yes, worst winter yes. of European history. I mean, nothing to what you normally have in Montana, but um, it was in 1963 and we weren't used to you know 16 foot of snow. But she she'd been nursing both her parents for a long, long time. Her mother had muscular dystrophy, one of those totally paralyzing things. And the last 10 years, she'd really been stuck at home caring for a, a much loved mother. Um, who really taught her what she needed to know about literature. But when she buried both her parents, she was like a sort of champagne cork, just off and out and free and energetic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, I, I, I recall a scene where, I mean, first of all, the idea of a single woman going through, especially like Iran in uh, at the time, uh, and I think there's a scene where she stops at a countryside inn and she eats, she's eating and she notices that behind there's a stream behind the inn where 
one place they're they're washing the dishes and the other men are essentially using it as a toilet and yes. and uh and she just she just goes in and she dines and she kips on the floor with the rest of them there and it's like my gosh this is so you know that's fearless just honestly uh if you uh, as a as a figure of a woman you know taking risks in unbelievable situations she's really a a, a remarkable uh character totally remarkable and and she's often listed beside your uh, if I say you're loosely, uh, Martha Gellhorn um, uh, from the Mississippi Valley as one of the great internationalist women who are absolute patriots uh, and just want to use their writing to help get their citizens engaged and interested in real things rather than right. the brittle right. prattle of party politics. And they are, I, I don't think they ever met, but they are a remarkable pair of activists and remain busy to the last. I've was rereading after Dervla Die, you sort of miss someone's voice, rereading some of her books. And the one she undertook age 60, bicycling through um, East Africa in the middle of its AIDS crisis is absolutely harrowing. That alone would be enough to be buried with and you don't need to mm -hmm. a word. But she completed 25 books um, in the end. And we helped uh, publish the last three, um, one in Cuba, very much, seeing Cuba of the eyes of a sort of defiant Ireland that had split off from the British Empire and the way that Cuba had split off from the sort of American zone of influence. And so right. quite, a, quite a sort of passionately, politically engaged, quite supportive book. Um, and then at the end of her life, she got really involved in um, journeying through Israel, Palestine, West Bank, um, Gaza. And she was still looking at her notebooks um, of Jordan um, and reluctantly realizing that that wasn't enough of experience to to merit a, a book. But mm -hmm. what you told me, there's some you know, extraordinary moments in that. Well, fantastic. I mean, it's such a, such a catalog that you're that you've been able to pull together. I guess John starting and then then what we've you've done with it uh moving on so tell us how did you uh, come across Stambul? i mean i assume it might have been part of your research material when you were writing your own uh, guide to istanbul is that true yes yeah, so, i mean it was a bit more complicated i'd started off with as a as a young man unemployable so i had to be a freelancer really uh, i did a, a guidebook to morocco and then got really interested in the rest of north africa I went to Tunisia with the, a girlfriend that turned out to be uh, my wife later on. And we wrote Tunisia together and then realized how different it was. And people in the end, local Tunisians said, you, well, you've got to go back. You know, the other story behind Tunisia, its identity is as a, a very strong province of the Ottoman Empire. And we had very close connections with Turkey. So you've got to, you know, if you want to understand more, go to Istanbul. So we went to Istanbul with a sort of marvelous sort of off the cuff mission of trying to understand Ottoman architecture and um, got the help of two um, very, very generous uh, historians in, in London. John Julius Norwich gave us a list of the sort of eight must-see late Byzantine things. And then someone who never got round to publishing, but was a great traveler called William Austin Owen. And he gave us a list of his favorite things in Istanbul, which were all Ottoman. There was a marvelous moment. The city was so complex that two really well-traveled men who'd given you completely different sort of guiding lines. And then John Judith Norwich also put us in touch with a, um, a young journalist called John Scott, who by chance had been working with Asa Nadir, that was a, a venture capitalist in the 90s in Britain who did very, very well before going bankrupt. And he'd run a magazine for the Turkish culture then, who was just playing around with uh, running his own. And we met him at the same time that we were sort of thinking about setting up a business. And you could just see behind me that row of white magazines. And that came, as it were, we've we've loyally watched and sometimes written for him, Cornucopia, an extraordinary, passionate magazine. It sells quite well in America amongst the diaspora of Turkish and Armenians and uh, Sephardic Jewish communities. And issue number 65 uh, is behind me. Wow. And that was a very, very nice meeting that all began on that sort of chance introduction. And we met in Rejans, which is still going, which is a, a white Russian um, 
a, a restaurant set up by white Russians after the, uh, the fall of the Tsarist regime, got on very well. And then he said, if you're interested in publishing, you should go and talk to Redstone Press, which was one of those great, on the side of the angels, the unacknowledged aspect of American amateur foreign policy is the Redstone Press was set up by missionaries, as was this mm -hmm. other extraordinary inst institution called Roberts College. And there are parallels in Beirut and in other parts of the Middle East where really very decent Presbyterian missionaries, people you might be rather embarrassed by now, actually set up amazing institutions which helped educate um, and really sort of reform cultures from in by giving absolutely first rate education funded by American generosity. And Redstone Press, we had, again, a wonderful coffee in this fantastic old 19th century warehouse down by what used to be the, um, the Dock Court and the Golden Horn. And this wonderful uh, American publisher who'd done dictionaries, Turkish English dictionaries, wonderful educational program, uh, produced the last copy, uh, which I've got here, which I thought I'd share with you. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be back to front. So this was produced by the Redstone Press in 1974, and it had gone out of print. But he gave us a copy, not this one, because I'm afraid we tore our original copy to pieces with reading and rereading. We didn't get to meet John Fully at that time, as I'll explain later. His life's quite rackety, and so he he moved on from Istanbul. But we ended up using as an absolute source book the guidebook he'd written with an English scholar called Hilary Sumner Boyd, called Strolling Through Istanbul, which has got to be up there with Pausanias, or is one of the great, great guidebooks of all time. Mm -hmm. It still survives in, in a version as the Blue Guide to Istanbul. And it was only years later, after we got commissions from two other English publishing companies, so we wrote uh, the AA Guide to Istanbul, and were unaware that it was going to be translated into 12 languages. So that had an extraordinary off influence. And then the Dorling industry, which also had um, a big translation budget, but it was all fueled by this book, um, the passionate Stamble sketches mm -hmm. and our work following the footsteps of John Freely and Hilary Sumner Boyd of inspecting all the byways and sideways of Istanbul. We, we'd never met John by this day, but we absolutely worshipped his eye and his, his eyes as a scholar, the dates, but even more than that, um, what this book, Stambul Sketches, gets is the living city, the mm -hmm. oddity and the quirkiness of it. And in roll on decades later, we ended up meeting his daughter, Maureen Freely, who is an English academic and thoroughly good activist uh, who's helped with index on um, censorship and various other sort of good causes, teaches in Bath and Bristol, and also worked as a translator. And with her help, I was able to um, track down her father, who was, <laughs> was moving around the world by then. <laughs> and I uh, got a lovely photograph of, of, of you know, drinking with him and then through him meeting um extraordinary set of friends, this sort of iconic photographer, Ara Gula, the so-called conscience of Istanbul, and um, Yasha Kemal, brilliant Turkish novelist, of all of that generation. And then we, um, so sort of, 10 years into um, running um, Eland, having taken it over from um, John Hatt, we were able to revive um, Stambul sketches, uh, which had been out of print for a long, long time there. And these secondhand copies are still uh, very rare, and I'm probably quite collectible now. And we were able to get hold of the original photographer, who was slightly annoyed with the production quality. Of yeah, the right. In, in these. Redstone Press had done their best, but they were they were dictionary, they were educational publishers, they didn't fully understand a sort of elegant travel books. And then we turned it into the Eland edition and then got hold of Sedat Paquet, uh, who had moved to Istanbul, um, by, um, moved from Istanbul to America by that stage. Oh, wow. And we, we got in contact with him and we said, we'd like to, it's going to be a bit of work for you, but if you've got the original plates for this book, if you could scan them, we'd love to put them back into the book. And that was a really happy moment for him and for us. And shortly after that, uh, he died and his daughter and wife wrote very nice messages saying how much he'd enjoyed putting that early work back into a, a really tight new um, edition. 
Yeah, but definitely the photographs are, I mean, some of them are so striking um, and and really add to the whole, you know, the, the power of the book. Uh, uh, so it is nice to see them reproduced in, in much better quality. And, and that's what we try and do. We take our time getting hold of things. Um, it's often very, very difficult tracking down authors, particularly those who travel and write about foreign parts have almost all got very rackety lives <laughs> multiple girlfriends often different partners um have rows with publishers different literary agents they leave a terrible paper trail um which is one of the pleasures for me is to sort of do the research to find out who i should be signing a a contract with because right. wherever possible we like to be totally kosher and pay our royalties on the nail and um although we're a small business we, we sort of want to be as as good as the big corporations and on that point and then it was rather wonderful because john freely um we met regularly because the in in london there was a group of two turkish um a, a financier and a, a banker and um an american banker and uh, um some of the english foreign office set up a dining club revived something called the divan club which used to be run in the 1780 mingling ottoman and, and Ottoman people interested in, in, in the British Empire and um, English people interested in Turkey. And so we meet twice a year, a wonderful gathering of, you know, of people who just share passions of mm -hmm. Istanbul. And um, so we uh, spent many happy evenings with John Freely and you could see, but it was important, it was rather lovely that I fell in love with his words first because I found out that he was simply the most charming American you can ever meet anywhere in the world. <laughs> and he had um, a sort of Irish American background that made him even better chatting to anybody and a legendary capacity for drinking and talking <laughs> in a very Irish way. And also a sort of, um, which we can talk about later, an absolute passion um, for, for traveling that started off um, very, very young. Absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, he, it, I mean, and clearly, I, I browsed through his uh, autobiography, um, and um, you know he. I've got a copy of here just to flash. Yeah, up to, exactly. Verse, but um, who to to? It's one thing, you know, and I'm sure you understand this, having worked as a travel writer. It's one thing for a single person or even a couple to say, "We're going to you know, dive into traveling," and come what may but to do it when you're dragging three kids along <laughs> that's a complete because i've got three my wife and i have three kids and traveling yeah traveling as a family uh, involves logistics of a complete i mean you just have to be willing to to i mean that that's a that's a dervlo murphy kind of level of of yes. uh, of courage it's interesting because i uh, I spent my some of my childhood in Virginia Beach because my father was in the the Royal Navy and was seconded to um, work on the NATO staff that's run from Norfolk, um, uh, Virginia. So we did a lot of traveling um, up and down in America camping. Um, but I have to say, of all the nations in the world to travel with children, Turkey must be the winner. You um, On a normal flight, if you've got young children, you're immediately put at the head of the queue, ahead of the first class and business people who make way for children. And we uh, did our two guidebooks, Assisted and Distracted, by two very small blonde daughters. And ah. it really is the way to travel in Turkey. I mean, children, the restaurateurs treated you in a completely different way. You often stayed in hotels. Later on, we did other trips to exploring some of the classical sites in Turkey. And the children would be taken off you in the morning. And people said, you know, go and do your work. We'll look after your, your kids. Um, the people in the kitchen would, you know, would love to, you know, talk and chat. So mm -hmm. it, it is extraordinary. But to go further into John's own biography, which I got to know better and better talking to him and drinking with him over the years, because my I got a rather wonderful, inspiring hippie sister who lives on the west coast of Ireland, which is where John came from. Although he's American, he had quite a complicated story because, and I found that absolutely fascinating. He was Irish-American and the family ricocheted backwards and forwards across the Atlantic quite regularly, not only in his childhood, age six, he did his fourth crossing of the Atlantic by boat, which is a sort of wow. yeah. wonderful move. But his own Freely family had three generations before, one of them had gone to America, done quite well 
and was able to buy back the, the family farm before, you know, this early, you know, um, slid downhill by being sort of um, gentleman farmer, and, um, drinking too much and loving their cattle. And so there's a very rich, complicated, transatlantic fusion of this American Irish family. And his mother, who was the, one of the great heroes and role models of John Freedy's life, a Peg, married an Irish American. But I think sometimes he just, as a young man, he was drinking too much and she would come back for long stays with her grandparents or great aunts or great grandparents in Ireland. And so John was brought up by this amazingly charismatic mother, Peggy, and then would come back. And there's a, a wonderful, albeit rather bleak story when John, when they're back in Brooklyn, um, calls up the, the staircase, mom, um, are we working class? And her mother said, we would be if your father could keep a hold on his drinking and you know, keep, <laughs> keep hold of a, a job. And, and that you have this very, very rich Irish American uh, attitude, which John was, you know, always acknowledged. His father was obviously not the hero that his mother was, but mm -hmm. he ended up many, many jobs, many, many problems drinking and being a good Irish American. He ended up with a very steady job in the Brooklyn Cemetery, mowing the lawns there, digging the graves. <laughs> and um, John had, you know, quite a, a rackety childhood. No qualifications at all when he left school. So he was, he joined the Navy age 17, trained and went out to the Far East, ended up joining the end of the war, didn't see the big conflicts, but um, he was destined to be cannon fodder. And then he, with his ability to talk, he got on very well with the Catholic priest on one of these journeys back from the Pacific uh, conflict areas, who introduced him to a very neglected books theme, which is um, the great books of all time, which St. John's College, I think in Maryland. Yes, right, a right. Scheme in 1930s to help yes. people of, you know, who weren't in, in the slipstream of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, um, but, but needed some help. And, and John was um, given access by the priest to, the, to a great store of books, which he started reading. And then on the GI Charter, he was given a year of, you know, basically on, on Rockaway Beach, reading his way, as he said, from, from um, Homer's Odyssey to James Joyce's Ulysses. Drinking buddies. Um, so, you know, you, you're bright. Um, you've got no qualifications at all, but do this test. The GI Charter will get you in. And he joins this... Um, Normally, the um, the Christian brothers given a rather bad reputation in in Ireland, but they did a very very good job in running this university, accepting John, and then recognizing that this this drunken Irish American coming back from the wars had an exceptional intellect, mm -hmm. and he happened to be taught by a brilliant Christian brothers physics teacher. And by the end of it, not only did he graduate but they realized he should be pushed on uh, to do his PhD, did that. They, they thought, whoa, this is actually this sort of redneck, um, problem redneck boy um, who used to make his money working in a condom factory and mixing up um, uh, septic powders and every sort of <laughs> casual labor, and drinking most of the proceeds, was actually a brilliant physicist. And he gets recruited into um, the air of the... Um, um, Manhattan Project, which is the Matterhorn Project on that post-war period. Mm -hmm. So he's scooped up in this elite of 100 brilliant physicists working, many of them with emigres at the end of the war. And this unlikely um, um, man had fallen in love with Toots. This I wonder if there's a photograph of Toots. There, there isn't, but this absolutely glamorous, long-haired, amazing girlfriend he met on week one in college who could sing and could dance. And they made a vow together. I think they, they were blood siblings uh, and they vowed to go traveling. Right. And when a Princeton said, come on, stay. And Roberts College said, you, you know, come over in 1960. They both looked at each other and said, this is our opportunity. And as you said, they've already got three children. Right. They've got Maureen, Eileen and Brendan. Um, but they packed up and went to Roberts College, which opened them with, open arms it was a very free and easy collegiate life very america at its real best never quite certain 
how much of them were exiles from the McCarthy period of cleansing universities in America of any left-leaning academics and how much Roberts College was a sort of a safe house for some quite maverick characters. But I talked to um, John's uh, daughter and said that wasn't dad. He was a free thinker, but he was not um, anything organized of the left. Um, he and mum just went because they loved traveling. Mm -hmm. And they fell into this group of extraordinary, um, extraordinary open-hearted Americans, which included these sort of odd British characters who worked there as well, called Hilary Sumner Boyd, who was openly gay, um, art historian. James Baldwin came and um, spent a summer there. E extraordinary open field, Godfrey Goodwin, another sort of John Freely character, sort of self-taught expert on mm -hmm. Ottoman architecture. And they would organise walks on on Saturday with his kids, ending up with a restaurant, and um, on Sunday, Godfrey would do Ottoman walks. And so they they just, while teaching maths and physics and another little fun course called Physics for Poets, which I, I think you know, I'd <laughs> love to have had, you know, it's so sad when the humanities takes over all the sciences. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. He had this brilliant brain that he was teaching physics. It was an English language teaching media, which gets nationalized and becomes Bosphorus College. But the, the Turkish academics there were all incredibly proud of the long herit heritage of Roberts College. And um, he, um, it's a three-year contract, so it lasted 1963. And they, on the back of their long summer holidays, they've been able to do some immense travels in the Mediterranean Isles, to Greece, to Italy, Syria, Jordan, Israel. And they're really using the opportunity to travel, sometimes mm -hmm. just taking their children on other academic families who've got kids the same age and they go off and do something, but mostly um, as a traveling American family, but not the sort of posh East Coast with five um, right. suitcase porters meeting them and uh, rattling them off to the Grand Hotel, very much on a wing and a prayer. Mm -hmm. And John, all those totally brilliant, will end up writing about 25 books, if you include yeah. different editions there is absolutely hopeless with money. I, I, I saw that myself. And his <laughs> boots run the finances and run everything practical, the paperwork. Right. He could, teach, he could talk, he could type, but everything else um, in terms of paperwork was firmly um, run by his wife. Mm -hmm. And they, um, Hilary Sumner Boyd uh, was doing a big complicated book about the seven hills of Constantinople, a reference to you know, the second Rome linking in with, mm -hmm. with Rome. And John was really interested from his own difficult background of, of finding out the sort of popular culture, the street culture and how much was known and revered, not by the scholars, but by the normal people. And then they just suddenly decided, I think sometimes in 1970, let's pool our resources and do a book mm -hmm. together. And so strolling through Istanbul, this extraordinary, wonderful, passionately engaged guidebook had been about 12 years in the making by the time it was published in 1974. And I only recently found out that um, Istanbul Sketches, initially, this is a real neglected book story, uh, was off cuts. So the editor had got rid of all the rambling passages that weren't appropriate for a guidebook and ah. literally cut them on the floor. And um, and John quite well, he said, well, this is some of my best stuff. But they said it's not about a, a monument or a museum right, or right. a Byzantine church or a mosque. This is you're meeting a dervish, you're meeting a, a wandering minstrel, you're talking to gypsy acrobats. Um, you know, this is something mm -hmm. else. Fortunately, something else a couple of years later was put together. And again, Maureen is a professor of English and has written many books herself, translated even more. And she said, this one catches dad's spirit and energy and delight in people like nothing else. And I've read pretty much all of John Freely's books, apart from the science um, ones, and, and they're really good. But this is the one that uh, I think will keep his spirit uh, alive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's a it's a. What I like about this book, and, and it goes back to what the, 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 the one guy had said about, you know, being grabbed by the elbow and led through the streets is, you know, when when we as a family, we, we lived in, in Europe for uh, 20 years. And and so we visited Istanbul and Rome and many other cities. But uh, often we would hire a, a, a guy, but usually I would tell the guy, just 
start walking and tell us stuff you know don't don't take you know don't go to the top five sites because yeah. you know anybody can do that and and you know just just walk and tell us stuff because in a place like istanbul every street is has centuries of history and background and 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 particularly his choice to kind of align himself with evlia this uh the writer, uh, the Ottoman writer, and his own guide to the city, where he quotes passages, and then you you have that view, and then you're seeing it hundreds of years later, and it has changed, but it hasn't changed, you know. And that's, and I think Istanbul is one of those cities where it it it's constantly changing. I mean, the most recently uh, that I was there was probably 2018. Um, and you know, it's a massive city and developed miles and miles and miles out away from the original walls of the city that, that freely talks about, but it's still a, a hugely dynamic place, uh, where the, uh, you know, it's, it's just fascinating, and I love that. Uh, in fact, one of the things that struck me about this book, just after an observation, is it reminded me a lot of Italo Calvino's book, uh -huh. Invisible Cities, yeah. where, as many people point out, Invisible Cities is actually about one city, just different, you know, that, that Calvino didn't... In, uh, he he left it ambiguous enough to that one could read this as a description of a bunch of different cities or one city viewed from different perspectives and that's sort of the flavor that you get in Stambul sketches i think that's that's brilliant um and i totally agree um this Stambul sketches book brought evlia chelebi this extraordinary sort of 17th century no one quite like it, but the Peeps Diaries in London, um, there's a sort of Peter Pan, and he's an extraordinary traveller throughout the Ottoman Empire and worked very closely with the court. So there are very intimate descriptions of working with Sultan Murat IV, who was reconquering you know, Iraq for the Ottoman Empire and leading his armies in person and a devout man. And Evelia Chalib is there, and he's, he's a, an extraordinary revered figure in Ottoman culture, but He's too big, you know, it's 14 volumes. Mm -hmm. and even his Istanbul section, which is quoted, the best bits um, by John Freely, um, is a two volume work. And that's another theme of John Freely's influence on us is that once you've opened your eyes to Evlia Chelebi and his, and as you said, the city's living both in the 17th century and in John's time. And when you read the book, you're doing your own journeys and things change, but there's still enchantment. Uh, I totally agree in Istanbul. I uh, go there pretty much every year, sometimes one or, once or twice, normally for business, but um, business always packed in with pleasure. Um, so you have this city continuing on certain levels. And one of the people that we met um, in that circle of, of scholars around John Freely um, was Caroline Finkel, who's researching in the Ottoman archives. And I said, well, what about putting Evlia Celebi's book um, writings uh, back into print? And she said, uh, it's too difficult. It's too complicated language. It's Osmanli, which involves Arabic, Turkish, written in, in the uh, initial script that there's only one man. And he's a rather brilliant American professor in Chicago called Robert Dankoff. And um, you'll never get around to speaking to him. But you know, what a good idea. Go for it if you can. And then again, one of those letters you send off that would normally just put, be put in the trash. And I, I sent an email and he'd just finished a major, major 30 year <laughs> project. And I said, what about putting just the, the best of it together in a, in a short paperback? He said, what a good idea. <laughs> and did it. And he's again, um, one of those brilliant Americans, like so many of your great scholars, fueled by experience as a Peace Corps volunteer. And he grew up in um, an Orthodox Jewish family. So I think, well, a, a practicing um, Jewish family. So there's enough Hebrew going on that early on as a child, he was living with two or three languages, plus a bit of Yiddish, Hebrew and English. And he's, you know, he speaks about 18 languages and delighted in the complexity of 
of old Ottoman mm -hmm. and produced this um, fantastic um, translation for us, working with his um, key Korean scholar, um, Su Yong Kim, which is a selection of all Evliya Celebi's travels throughout the Ottoman Empire. And we've, um, as well as talking to Brad, I've also been talking to William Dalrymple, who runs a Empire podcast yeah, series. Right, called. right. Very, very popular in Britain. And we got Caroline Finkel um, talking about Evelia Chilliby with William and uh, Ananda. Um, and that was a, a wonderful discursive, sort of 55 minutes examining um, this character. But that thread of passion for us to get this done, ended up getting grants and working with universities, you know, quite a lot of work, um, was all directly credited to that enchantment of Stambul sketches, as you mm -hmm. quite rightly point out, Brad, is it's actually it sometimes is only a third John, and it's mostly Evelia Celebi, long, long, wonderful quotes set in the streets where he's looking at, particularly, you know, the Sultan's um, Murat the Fourth having a gathering of all the the guilds of Istanbul, and he's on that wonderful kiosk on the end of the top Kapi Palace, looking at the gates of the the Grand Vizier, and he. All the processions, is it 732 of the, of the guilds of old right. Istanbul are in their carriages, all passing by, and, you know, showing what they can do. Fantastic demonstration, sort of unbelievable sort of cinema of the mind. Right, I, I, right. And, um, and, and, and that, you know, is yet another thing that John Freely sparked off for us. This, you know, it's wonderful to just rehearse his nature. Right, Irish American from a very alcoholic, drunken, chaotic family, becomes professor of physics, right up there with the the gods of the American early, you know, um, uh, nuclear project in, in, right. in the Feynman. Yeah, comes to Istanbul to teach what he knows best, generously, um, and then becomes this sort of just for the fun of it, for the for the crack of it, this sort of Ottoman historian, and 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 just gets enchanted a, a ways landed up one thing that struck me because the procession of guilds because it, it's it's an example of how that aspect although of course there's no longer a vizier and there's no longer a a, a sultan and there's no longer perhaps the parades of but the guilds are still there if you wander in the streets up back behind the grand bazaar you know you You'll find there's the street of the you know the the tin the tinsmiths are still there, uh, but but there's all sorts of variation and I I regret not being able to find it because but uh, the last time we were there there's the street of the CPAPs, you know, <laughs> you know these uh, things that you wear when you're uh, uh, have uh, sleep apnea so. Uh, you wander up that little hillside back from the Grand Bazaar far enough and you'll hit the, the, the little block where every single shop is selling CPAP machines. <laughs> it is um, it is astonishing. And and we've um I was just looking, you know, um reminding myself of the wonder of Stamble sketches, the, the old book bazaar by the Bearzet Mosque, uh, the Bearzet Square is still, as Evlia Celebi describes it, as John Freely describes it. And um, as I got to know Istanbul better, it was wonderful taking tea and coffee with old booksellers there, showing you their treasures and, you know, quite a lot of junk. It looks like a sort of some aspects of the charity shop, but then you go into a cupboard and there are original 18th century copies of Mary Wortley Montague's Turkish Embassy letters, you know, an extraordinary treasure house. And, um, and so that is... You know why Istanbul sketches is so encouraging. It really encourages you, as you've done and know what to do, is to you know don't ignore the five sites, but also make your magic. There are things to be discovered and versions of Istanbul living up to its sort of mythology, as as put out for us by John Freely. Um, you know his musicians. We found I found it entrancing to find in the in the European quarter, not the quarter that he's describing. That there's still wonderful street musicians. Um, gathering and and it was great to see that it wasn't a tourist crowd; it was just Turks gathering around mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, actually being remarkably generous to their own itinerant musicians in in a way that John Freedy would have been very proud of. Right. Um, I want to. We're we're coming up to the hour. Uh, did did oh, you have a passage you wanted to uh, 
to share because there, I mean, there are so many good ones in here. Uh, I mean, the, uh, not, I, I, I was going to, I love oh, the passage about the Galata bridge, partly because if you've walked. Me too. Me bridge, too. Go with that. Go with that. <laughs> That's mugged up by me as well. <laughs> okay. Would you, uh, would you mind reading a, a paragraph or two from that? Absolutely. Good plan. I've got so many bookmarks. They're all. Um... Maybe page 48. The Galata Bridge has a greater intimacy with the oh, water. Oh, yes, yes. Yep. I got my yellow mark there. <laughs> One of the best places from which to view the Galata Bridge is on the Stamboul shore of the Golden Horn, on the quay which is called the Fisherman's Meeting Place. We often amuse ourselves there by boarding and floating sea museum of Yasha Kashim, where two senile seals splash and grunt in a pool of filth, delighting the peasants who pay one copper coin to watch. Yasha Kasim is a foul-tempered dwarf, and there's one of Thedat's photographs of, <laughs> of um, so this is not made up. His advertisement is a lecherous-looking pelican with bloodshot eyes who stands balanced on one leg and looks cynically upon the passing scene. But perhaps the pelican's eyes are jaundiced only by the boredom of his job. We, we ourselves are always fascinated by the picturesque and lively activity on and around the bridge. Rattling trucks and buses and antique public taxis roar out of the narrow crowded streets of Stamboul and put to rout their natural enemies, the police. They pass the city's single traffic light, ignoring its changing colours and race madly across the bridge, enjoying their brief freedom before entering the narrow crowded streets of Galata. Fleets of ferries honk and smoke and whistle obscenely upon their noisy arrivals and departures beside and under the bridge like swift white and yellow water bugs skimming to and from the maritime quarters of the town. The opposing crowds swarm on and off like two commuting armies colliding in a desperate amphibious struggle. A tourist caught between the lines finds himself teetering on the tilting gangway, slipping on the oily deck, tangling in the mooring ropes, tripping over the coal pile, and is finally sat upon by two voluminous ladies in a second-class lounge. You can do that any day. A porter carrying a dozen empty oil drums is locked in combat with a patriarch, dragging home a sacrificial ram for the holidays. A legless beggar is trampled on by a giant blind man. A perfumed aristocrat is wrapped in reluctant embrace with a ragged farmer reeking of the sheepfold. An old woman struggles with an obstinate goat and is knocked down by a tree. She's been carried aboard by a drunken forester. A hairy stoker, peering out for the flaming boiler room, smiles with affection at a passing fisherman. The departing ferries leave the dock before the crowd is safely aboard, and there's a half minute of great excitement as athletic young men leap across the widening gap. But the last one aboard is a crippled old crone who comes hobbling down the dock, frantically waving her crooked cane. At the last possible moment, she's thrown onto the ferry like a bag of old clothes, unraffled. She picks herself up and engages in conversation, another bag of old clothes, her dear friend. The passengers then doze off while the ferry transport them to an older and more serene continent. I mean, it's just so, uh, what a wonderful uh, synopsis of, uh, of observation of what the, uh, what's going on there, because it is such a frenetic scene and uh and, and so much comes together uh, uh and that's that's what's uh so amazing about uh, spending any time in istanbul is uh it it still is such a crossroads of civilizations uh even uh even though you know turkey is such a strong national force in the city uh but there's still aspects you can see all over and probably like you, Brad, I mean, you once bullied by old travellers saying, oh, dear boy, don't bother, you know, the city, <laughs> all the charm is gone. But year after year, I return and do not wish to be defeated and never am. But can I just read one little paragraph? Yes. This? this is exactly what you would find if you went there tomorrow. The most distinguished of all the markets which cluster around Yeni Jami is the uh, Egyptian market, perhaps better known as the Spice Bazaar. The Spice Bazaar is a veritable museum of Eastern smells, drugs, gums, herbs, spices, perfumes and incense, as if all the aromatic lands of Asia had concentrated their most exotic odours here under one roof, 
so as to introduce the traveler to the heady atmosphere of the Orient. As Evelia writes, the Egyptian grocers pass armed on wagons filled with baskets of ginger, pepper, cardamom, cinnamon, cloves, rhubarb, spikenard, and aloes, forming altogether 3,000 items. The bazaar is also famous for its coffee stores, where according to Olivia, the coffee merchants are employed in grinding coffee for all of Constantinople. And that's a scene you and I have been lucky enough to smell and scent. Absolutely, and yeah. Wonderful deja vu following in John Freely's steps, following in um, Evelia Celebi's 17th century sort of equal passion. Well, Barnaby, thank you for that reading. Uh, what, what, what's, I mean, uh, this book is so rich in, in scenes like that, and that's why you can, you can dive into it uh, again and again. Uh, I wanted to take a moment, if there is anybody in our audience who wanted to ask a question or offer their own observation, we'd be happy to open it up. Uh, just to go ahead and uh, go off mute or raise your hand if you wish to do that and uh, chime on in. Phyllis? Uh yeah, well, thank you so much for all of this because you filled in some uh, gaps that I just had. My nose was kind of twitching, thinking there might be something to it. Um, the Ire Ireland connection is what kind of interested me a lot because of some work I'm doing. And I, I really, uh, this helps that my instincts have been um, validated by what you've told me about his connections. Uh, in particular, the the graveyard scene where the laughing um the laughing uh, monuments uh, uh, where the, the inscriptions um, are there. Right. And, it's, and it's just such an Irish attitude towards death, um, a la uh, uh, Martin O'Kane and, uh, and the graveyard clay and the, uh, you know, that, that uh, novel. And also I, um, I really liked, uh, again, in my very narrow and shallow knowledge of Irish geography and history, that same feeling that, when you're walking around, you're walking on this in the same dust, you know, that <laughs> has been walked on by humankind <laughs> since they knew how to walk practically. So um, anyway, that helped a lot. Thank you. I mean, to add to that, um, John Freely came from a Kerry family, which is the most possibly the most distinctive right. West Coast of all yes. the three great blocks of Gaelic speakers. And yeah. I'd be with, with my sister on that beach. And John said, the farmhouse that overlooks that beach, that was our farm. Oh, and there's, wow. a, there's a bar there. Oh. And I, I had a barbecue there with my, uh, my sister got all of our siblings together. We're a dysfunctional lot, you know, one from Venezuela, <laughs> one from Switzerland, you know, from Ireland. And we made a barbecue and there were cars going, there was drinking, there was fires lit and that the Irish ability to enjoy themselves. Um, mm -hmm. I told John about that and he said, oh, that's amazing. Could, he could remember being age six going, I think, to the wake of his great grandfather. So you had that death <gasps> cult and the beating of the wren, he could remember the a tradition that goes back, you know, way before Christianity, um, part of the sort of the solar equinox, solar tradition. Yes. And yes, he yes. was doing that as a boy. And you, Sometimes with John Freely, you are touching the most extraordinary touchstone of historical continuities in his own life as a Irish American. Uh, oh, great! Amazing. Thank you. That's great. I'm going to read his autobiography now. That's my my next uh, goal. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, anyone else uh, have anything they'd like to uh, chime in and and uh, ask uh, Barnaby about, or uh, just you know, offer your thoughts about the book? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up here. Uh, I just want to mention that we uh, will be coming back together in um, just a second. In there we go. On the 25th of April, we'll be talking to another uh, London based uh, uh, publisher, Turnpike Books, which tends to focus on uh, books. Uh, by writers from Ireland and Northern Ireland, and we'll be talking about Brian Moore's probably uh, one of his best novels, uh, The Emperor of Ice, Ice Cream, which is definitely about uh, Belfast and uh, life in Belfast before the Troubles. Uh, so uh, that will be announced on Twitter and through my uh, my own site, and uh, we'll be making that available on Eventbrite for folks to show sign up for. 
Uh, Barnaby, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us. Wonderful uh, stories and, uh, and especially learning more about John Freely in the background of the book. I think everybody uh, who, uh, who joined us today or will see this on YouTube will appreciate that. Well, it's been a total pleasure. And, and you know, apart from marketing my books, uh, John Freely was one of those, you know, wonderful, lucky chances. And I must testify to Brad, I was trying to search for a forgotten book and all leads led to him. And he answered my emails back quickly and enthusiastically professionally. So he's a remarkable man. And uh, I'm very delighted to be um, part of this. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you uh, in April talking about Brian Moore's uh, novel. Thank you so much, thank Barnaby. You. Thank Pleasure. you.